Okay, folks, I am aware that uh, there's still folk coming in, but we are now at three minutes past four, so I think we'd uh, we'd better get started. Just to let you know, as with all these uh, national webinars on dyscalculia, this whole series, it is being recorded. Thanks again to my colleague Jeremy from Education Scotland who's recording this. Much appreciated. Um, so we'll get the recording started now. Um, and the, you know, for any colleagues that um, I've been unable to make this or any of the earlier webinars, um, these recordings are available to you. So um, a very warm welcome again to you uh, on what's sure been a very busy day for you. So um, we're very grateful for you joining us. My name's Iona Coots. I'm one of the Education Officers in Numeracy and Maths here at Education Scotland. And we're absolutely delighted to be able to provide this series of national webinars on understanding dyscalculia. My colleagues, I uh, no, I know that's me, uh, Jacqueline and Maria from the Numeracy and Maths team are also here and they're going to be able to uh, just man the chat and just direct any questions to us uh, during the session. So uh, please do um, pop your questions in the chat or um, pop your, uh, um, it's probably going to be easier to pop questions in the chat rather than hands up uh, because there are quite a large number of people on the call today. So um, a very warm welcome to you all and to my colleagues, uh, maybe Louise and Laura, you might just want to pop your cameras on so you can say hello at the beginning. So a very warm welcome to uh, Louise Bain, who's a principal teacher in uh, the East Ayrshire support team, as you can see, and also to Laura Scott, who is the dyscalculia yeah. lead with the uh, Glasgow Dyscalculia Support Service. Um, those of you who've been along to the previous sessions won't be a stranger to either of those. So uh, you're going to hear a lot less from me and a lot more from them, which I'm sure you'll be happy about. You should be able to see the slides today. Fingers crossed everything's working. We have checked them. Uh, but uh, there have been issues, certainly we found issues with Teams earlier on today, so fingers crossed you can see the slides. And I'm sharing in PowerPoint Live today, which means any of the web links that you can see on the screen, if it's one that you would particularly like just to click on to open in your browser and have it handy, um, <clears throat> Please do just click on that and you should be able to see it. You should also be able to navigate back and forwards in the slides. And if you get disconnected from the slide that we're on, uh, you have the opportunity to sync with the presenter um, as well. So hopefully you can see the slides and we'll be able to move on with them um, as we go through the presentation today. Our contact details are on the, on the screen, as you can see. Um, you are very welcome to get in touch with either the maths team here at uh, Education Scotland or the inclusion team at Education Scotland if you have any particular questions. And you can see uh, Louise and, uh, and um, Laura have uh, Twitter accounts there that you can get in touch with. So um, we will share, uh, you can certainly get in touch with us here at Education Scotland. And, and I know Laura and Louise are happy to, to be in touch with people uh, going forward as well. Today's main session is we're going to look at teaching strategies and approaches that support learners that have difficulties with numeracy and mathematics. Um, we are focusing on dyscalculia in this series. However, um, these approaches will support learners uh, who have difficulties in numeracy and maths for any, any reason. And uh, particularly looking at a, a, a number of strategies for supporting learners, both on a, a sort of individual and small group basis, but also in learning and teaching um, as a whole. The aims of this session then are to provide signposting to resources and activities that will support all learners, including those with dyscalculia. So some of the things that we signpost will be um, publications and support documents from Education Scotland, but a lot of what we signpost won't be from uh, ourselves. They will be to external agencies and suppliers. So um, these are just coming with recommendations, but do feel free to um, add your own recommendations in the chat as well. Um, this is, there will be opportunities for you to do that during the session. Just a reminder of the ongoing support that is available as well. Um, we have our uh, Padlet, um, which supports the webinar series. And as I said, the link is on the screen there. Um, you can navigate to that if you like. That's where you can find the recordings and slides of previous sessions. 
and a link to all the websites that we recommend and some additional uh, professional reading and additional sources of support, um, additional documentation that we, we mentioned in webinar two around identification and ongoing support of learners. That's all there. So you'll find that on the, on the, the Padlet. And there's also additional support documentation uh, from East Ayrshire Council that you will find there as well. So that's quite enough for me. Um, Louise is going to take over and just do a little bit of a recap of some of uh, the main points from webinars one and two that we just to say, uh, lay foundations for what we're talking about today. Um, and also some approaches to learning that Louise herself has found useful. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Laura on a number of, of, of things uh, to do that surround dyscalculia as well. So I will stop talking now and hand over to Louise. Hi everyone and a very warm welcome again today. Um, as Iona said, we are going to be looking at um, strategies and approaches which Laura and I have found to be helpful um, in supporting our learners with dyscalculia. But to begin with, I think it's really important that we pull ourselves right back to our Scottish definition because within that it actually identifies particular um, from a Scottish government point of view exactly what we should be doing. So as we can see here, learners with dyscalculia will benefit from appropriate early intervention, support planning and review. So that's going back to what we discussed in our last session about that assessment and how we identify learners with dyscalculia. And then today we're going to be thinking more about that planning stage and the support. Also, young people would benefit from tailored support, for example, actively encouraging the use of specific materials, which may include concrete materials and visual representations. We're going to get into that in quite a bit of detail today. Um, and effective inclusive learning and teaching pedagogical approaches and environments. That's it back to what Iona was just talking about there. It's not just that kind of individual support, but also thinking about that full class. So it's really, really important that we do help our learners as well to identify what supports work for them and also encourage them um, to use this. So let's just have a little look here and a little bit closer about what this would look like in practice. And these really are the kind of pedagogical principles rather than specific resources and approaches which have been proven eh, to support learners with um, dyscalculia or those that are experiencing difficulties with numeracy and mathematics. And all of these within the section which I'm about to talk about just now are included in the booklet which Iona had showed um, just at the beginning. Um, I spent quite a lot of time because a lot of our, our um, because we'd obviously Several years ago, we had launched our policy, but a lot of staff were coming back. They'd made that identification. It was back to that. So what? How are we going to then use that assessment information to in order to then support our learners? So what I did um, around Christmas time was I pulled a lot of the, the research um, that I've been, I've been doing over the years. And I worked very closely with colleagues from Dyscalculia Network and also with Iona and Laura and Maria. And I pulled together that, that the booklet, which has now been shared within East Ayrshire, but we're happy to share as well. And we'll put that onto the, the Padlet. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here is all included um, within that. So firstly, we're going to start off with this first statement, which um, Isabel had said way back in 1968, that planning of learning and teaching and assessment must begin from where the learner is at. The most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain this and teach them accordingly. Now, this looks quite simple and it really is common sense, of course, but it describes something quite profound. Because within particular when you were saying mathematics, every new piece of learning builds on that wealth of knowledge and the understanding and skills which have actually come before. And some of these are really, really fundamental. For example, visual perception, visual memory and motor skills. And learners need to show or come to understand how their learning then all links together and where new learning links in that network of knowledge which they already have. So if we move on then, to this next part where it's about thinking about what our learners already know. And again, these next three statements are very, very simple. So let's think about it. Think about this first one. Think about what concepts are required before teaching a new one. Again, it may sound very, very simple, but let's think about the concept within maybe second level we're teaching about perimeter. So within the chat, have a little think about perimeter. And what key skills and knowledge and understanding would a learner have to already have before you even start to, um, to tackle perimeter? Have a little think and pop some ideas into the chat. 
So what knowledge, understanding and skills would a learner have to have before tackling perimeter? Yeah, addition, vocabulary. Yeah, we're going to be touching a wee bit more on that later on. Addition, measurement. Yeah, understanding of the, the units, the, the kind of terminology, the ability to measure possible properties of the 2D shapes that they're going to be using for the perimeter. Yeah. Absolutely. We've got number names, uh, units of vocabulary. Um, yeah, lots and lots coming in there. Fabulous. Great. Absolutely great. So doubling, yeah, as well, depending upon obviously what shape we're doing. So we can see already just from that simple concept of perimeter that we have to then go back and identify what is it that our learner has to then know. And then if they haven't got a particular skill or um, concept, we have to then go and then do that first before we would move on um, to perimeter. So planning as well of that learning, the teaching and assessment, it must begin therefore from where we're actually at. So it may be that we've then got to use effective assessment to then go back and identify if there are any gaps before we go on to teach a new concept and then using our curricular planners that you may have within your authority in order to identify that. And it may actually be that we have to then take things back slightly we may have to take a few steps back if they are struggling and, ident and address the gaps there before we then move on to the next concept. So just going in that example there, it may be that our young people don't have the idea of addition or concept or shape or those particular aspects of the vocabulary and the language. So we have to then perhaps take our, our learning and teaching a wee bit back, address those difficulties before we actually move on to the new one. Next, again, I feel as if we're teaching to the converted here, but we really do have to be structured, particularly for those learners who have got dyscalculia, because as we know, dyscalculia is having that difficulty, particularly around about number sense, and that the young people need that constant overlearning and overlap in teaching in order to get that real conceptual understanding, which we'll talk about a bit more detail. So we really do have to ensure that our learning and teaching is structured and that concepts are really broken down into very, very small progressive steps. We also have to make sure that what we're teaching is sequential. So for example, a young person has to be able to count before they can actually add and subtract. I mean, I've got a young one at the moment where and um, the teachers read when we did a bit of an assessment, um, he was really, really struggling with subtraction. But the reason he was struggling with subtraction was because he couldn't count back. And we, we actually pulled that right back. He couldn't count back within 20. So obviously that young person has to go back. They have to address that before we move on. So again, it's about that, that no amount of effort with us teaching that subtraction. There was no way that we we're going to get it because we didn't actually have that building block and the scaffolding that came first. So as I said again, if they're confused, then we do have to actually go back. Breaking down problems as well, we could break everything down into that really, really structured um, question so that we can then ensure that they've got a real grasp of what we're doing. And then the first comment that I'd made there as well was starting with the easiest question. Maybe not even the easiest question. Sometimes it may actually be that taking a concept and putting it into an easier um, framework or a, an easier range. Um, again, for example, recently I had a young person with dyscalculia who has been really struggling with division and multiplication. Um, the young person's in primary six, but then when we track all that back, multiplication and division was introduced in primary three during that first lockdown. So that young person hadn't had that, those particular building blocks, those concrete experiences, and didn't have an understanding. He had bits of sporadic understanding about um, multiplication, but when it came to division, no concept at all. So after a bit of work with him, I worked out he had two times table, five times table, ten times table. So I pulled everything right back and I taught him the concept of division through the two, five and ten times table. And then I was able to increase the range and he was actually by the end of it able to divide uh, millions as such um, because he had that conceptual understanding. And then I could obviously grasp and work with him on that, that multiplication as well. So it's back to, as I just said, developing that conceptual understanding before we develop those procedural thinkings. They must have a real, real deep understanding of the concepts before we jump onto it. And Iona and I have been having lots and lots of discussions about this recently, and we'll have a few examples um, later on. And the one that I always have that springs to mind is how many of our learners can do a chimney sum for addition but they've got no real understanding of that mathematics behind it. The young one that I'm working with, another one, um, 
I could give that young person a, a calculation in the form of a chimney sum and could show me no problem. Um, but when I then drilled down with that young person, I gave her the exact same sum as a horizontal and she got it all wrong because she was, wasn't using the correct place value. She didn't have that conceptual understanding of exactly what she was doing. So I had to strip it right back, build that back up, and now she's able to, to add up to the thousands part um, with a real clear understanding of what she's doing. So in order to actually develop these conceptual understandings, we really need to think about an approach that would be most appropriate. And one such approach which has been proven to support learners experience difficulties, but also just all learners with numeracy and mathematics, is the idea of concrete pictorial abstract. And I'm sure that you're all very, very familiar with this as it's becoming more and more widespread in Scottish schools. But this approach is not new. It's based on solid research um, and evidence. And many people mistakenly think that this approach was imported from Singapore. And I was one myself. I often thought it was through that. Um, I did the Future Asian Math course as well um, through your university. And it, there was an awful lot about the concrete um, pictorial abstract. But it was actually developed back in the 1960s when an, a, an American psychologist, Jerome Brumler, proposed this approach as a means of scaffolding um, learning. And he believed that the abstract nature of learning which is especially true within numeracy and mathematics, was a mystery to many children and therefore needed to be scaffolded by effective representations and maths manipulatives. So let's think about this in the concept of, of reading, just for a second. And Laura and I have been in several courses recently with Professor Sharma, and he talks about the links between learning and acquiring literacy skills and learning and acquiring numeracy skills. And Laura is going to get into this in a bit more detail later on. But what we kind of do is, is we accept that what our young people need to be able to do is they need to be able to see a word before they can actually read it or spell it and then put together, for example, the magnetic letters k -a -t to make the word cat. And it would be even more helpful if they had a picture of a cat as well to go along with that, to get that full idea. So we think about just all the skills that were involved within that one aspect of reading. The same goes for numeracy and mathematics. And for many of our children, those mathematical concepts without that concrete, tangible resource and picture would just be completely meaningless to them. And I think a really important thing that we have to bear in mind is that this is not just within infants. This is about second, third level and beyond all stages of the school, including secondary learners if it's required, should be introduced to new concepts using this approach. <clears throat> and then when they come to that written algorithm, they should hopefully have that kind of conceptual understanding. So what is CPA, conceptual, uh, concrete pictorial abstract? So let's think about that concrete. So the new concepts are introduced through the use of physical objects and practical equipment. And these are physically handled so that the young people can actually explore the mathematical concepts. And we often refer to these as mathematical manipulatives. Once they're con confident with that, we then move on to the pictorial representations or quick sketches of objects. But by doing this, they're no longer needing these manipulatives or the physical resources, but they need that visual prompt. And it may not even need to be a picture. It may be an empty number line because they're physically showing something on it or jumping on that. And then um, or also another example of this might be a uh, bar modelling as well, which Laura is going to touch on later on. And then once they've got that complete and utter conceptual understanding within the concrete and the pictorial, we then move on to abstract symbols uh, to model the problems. And these are numerals within numeracy and mathematics. So in a really simple way, we can see from this illustration here, we've got the one apple and one apple. If we're doing an addition sum. So we can see we've got physically you would have the apple sitting and put them together. And then we would move on to that pictorial where we have a picture of an apple and another picture of an apple. And then moving on to that abstract where we've got our symbols. And a key thing to remember as well from this though is that learners are at different journeys within their development and it's not linear then. For most effective teaching to take place, children constantly need to kind of go back and forward within these different stages just to reinforce and to make sure that it's understood. And it may be that we've got a lot of learners that actually can move quite quickly onto the abstract, but then an awful lot of learners really have to stick with that concrete. 
So next we can move on then to so another thing that I've touched on already is that dyscalculic learners benefit a lot from overlearning and using a wide range of different visuals and concrete materials in order to do this. So trying to kind of do not just within one particular setting, but actually across a range of settings so they can actually transfer their thinking. So here, for example, we're looking at the number six. We can see it, number six in our fingers. We can see the pictorial with the leaves. We can see with the wrecking wrecks. We can see that we're going to be making the numbers using tally marks, uh, 10 frames. So it's the idea that we don't just use the one type of resource or one type of manipulative, that we give our young people that opportunity to explore in a wide range of ways when we're teaching new concepts. Another really important tip would be um, supporting the ability of our young people to answer using a wide range of methods. And as I said already, they will all be developing at different levels. But if we can teach them different ways that they can have for their mark making, et such, um, then they can decide what would be best for them. And number talks is usually the best way or they'll think it through jotters where we can actually see where they are developmentally. Learners can show they're working, for example, using that concrete materials. We can see here some of the our young people have been using mark making and some would have a kind of combination of these. And a particular example that always comes into my head is I was working with a, quite a large class of, of young people um, in primary seven on multiplication. The young people were having real struggles with it. So we did lots and lots of work and I was doing a number talk with them one day. So I put up the problem on the board and it was amazing that I could then just, because I would taught all the different ways and representations, it was great to just do a quick sweep around the room and I could see very, very quickly where my young people were developmentally. So I had the young person who was physically drawing out groupings and making pictures. And then I had the other person who was sitting, count, uh, skip counting. I had the wee one who was just kind of nodding their head and they had some sort of visualisation. So it's really important that if we give our young people the wide range of tools that they can use, then we can then see developmentally where they are. It's also really important as well, when they're moving towards that written algorithm, there are lots and lots of different representations which we can actually use. So if we look at this one here, the 57 add 35, we can use the place value counters in place of in place of um, a place value table or the base 10 materials. So that's more of a kind of concrete moving into our pictorial. And this really leads nicely onto that partitioning approach, which is shown down the bottom. Um, with the blue and the yellow, where we've got, as you can see, the 50 add the 30 makes the 80 and the 7 add the 5 makes the 12 and then we're adding it on. So we're really breaking that calculation down. And that's exactly what I did with the young person I was speaking about earlier on who could do the chimney sum but just didn't have that concept. And then we move on to the next calculation where we have the exact same again. We have it in that chimney sum approach, but you can see that instead of using the carrying, which a lot of our young people have not got a clue of, particularly those with dyscalculia, then we're actually making sure that the young people know exactly what they're doing. So we're telling them it's the seven, and, they tell us seven and five is 12. So they write 12 down and they write it in the correct place value. And then it's not five add three, it's 50 add 30, and that gives us 80 and then they can add those digits together. So that's a really, really useful tool that I've used successfully for many years now is that bridge between moving from that um, pictorial representation into being able to go to that full, the traditional method that we have. Another really, really good tip for a lot of our learners is that discussion about their maths. It's so, so beneficial as we know for many reasons. It can let our young people clarify their thinking by talking it out. And often our learners, if they're talking it out, can actually then identify their own mistakes. Um, how often do we say to them, how did you do that again? And then as they start to talk it through, they're like, oh, I've made a mistake. And they're actually then going back and, and changing their ideas. And it also allows our learners to develop that mathematical behaviour of justifying their ideas and forming a reasoned argument with each other, particularly if you have um, a calculation where no one answer is correct. Um, sometimes we're just looking for that optimal answer. And then how do our learners know that they've got a valid answer and how could they be sure that it's an optimal one? So it's about that discussion, that discussion with their peers and as a class is really, really important um, for looking at that. 
And linking in with that, one of the things which um, I've been finding fascinating, I probably have been doing it through teaching for a long time now, but I haven't realised that this is what I was doing, was using a script. And this is um, Professor uh, Sharma, as I was speaking about earlier on, he's a firm advocate for using discussions to embed that learning. And he talks about this within that concrete pictorial abstract approach. And what Sharma explains is that learners find it really, really difficult moving from the pictorial onto the abstract. And what he does is he encourages the use of a discussion in the form of a script alongside visualisation to support this. And thus he developed the concrete pictorial visual abstract. So he's got that visualisation aspect, aspect in there. So this approach differs from that conventional CPE approach and its emphasis uh, on that visualisation. And the visualisation acts as that bridge between the pictorial representation and the abstract. So once that young person has got the image of what they've just been doing with the concrete and the pictorial in their head, with the guidance of a teacher, they can then have that what was it that I did? It's kind of in their own mind's eye. So the script is actually helping them talk through and work through what they were actually doing with the concrete and the pictorial. In effect, then we're getting the learners to kind of reenact what they just did using those manipulatives. So here's an example that I've got here for just adding a single digit with bridging using, using a part, part whole method. So I want you just to imagine that you've been working with your learner over a period of time. You started off, for example, using the um, the pneumocon rods, where you're then using that alongside the, the concrete cuisinier rods, when they're, they're actually physically putting in um, the rods in order to work out how they're doing the bridging. And the first thing that you're then saying to that young person is, OK, here is your, here is your calculation. It's 37 add 8. Mm -hmm. And these are the same words that you'd be using at concrete pictorial as well as that visualisation stage. So the first thing you're saying is, what is the next multiple of 10? The young person would say, it's 40. And if you've got the visualising it on their Numicon road, how many do you need to get to 40? So then that young person then saying, OK, I need three to get up to the 40. And how are we going to get the three? I want you to add on eight. So they've got their visualisation of their eight and then how they split that up into the five and the three. So they're adding on the three and then the five. So how many have I got left then to add? I've added on my three. It's the five that are adding on. So what would the answer be? It's going to be 45. So as I said, if you're using that script with the young person, that step by step as they're going along, then it gets them into a routine that they can then work through on their own. I used it recently as well as the young person I was speaking about with division earlier on. And I used a script with him. It was after finding um, this out uh, and I did it more kind of consciously. And I'm, I actually wrote the script out for him um, so that he had that and it makes like a step-by-step -step process for moving from that pictorial into the abstract written algorithm for division for him that he could then work through until he was more fluent and been able to do it um, on his own. And there's a really, really good article all about this. Um, this link is just down the bottom, um, which goes into a lot more detail about it. Another um, idea which he has as well, um, and Laura's going to get into a bit more detail about this later on, and it's to support our learners with that visualisation and how we break up the numbers. He encourages the use of the visual cluster cards. And what these are are a set of playing cards which have different representations of numbers on them. So they're not the way that in the traditional method for playing cards, you can see with this one that I've got here that it's a visual representation of nine, but it's actually, you can see that it's got the three and then the six, or it might be that you've actually saw it differently. Maybe you've saw the five and the four. So you can see here, it, it is really, really good because it's showing our young people, it's that subitising again and getting them to be able to manipulate and break up numbers in different ways. And I said, Laura will talk a wee bit more about where this all comes from um, later on. And this link that I've put down the bottom for you is a link to a really good video, um, which will go through this in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to hand it over to Laura now, and she's going to get into a bit more detail about strategies which we can use to support our learners. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Louise. Hi, everyone. I'm just saying a quick hello. Um, I'm Laura Scott from Glasgow Dyslexia Support Service. For anybody who joined a bit later, I'm going to put my camera off and take you through some strategies.
Okay, so I'm now going to take you through some strategies to support issues that may arise in relation to dyscalculia. And in specifically, I'm going to talk about maths anxiety, mistakes, memory, processing speed, language of maths and reading. Now, I'm aware that some of the people attending this session might be from different backgrounds, professions and have sort of different levels of experience. So I hope you can appreciate I'm trying to accommodate this. So I will go through the things that are mentioned on the, the screen here, and then Louise will follow on and discuss some resources and digital manipulatives after me. Okay, so last time we spoke, I spoke about maths anxiety, and we didn't really talk about strategies to support, so I thought it would be helpful to do that. Um, as we know, we have to deal with maths anxiety first so that learners feel that they're in a position to learn. In terms of collaborating or working alone in relation to maths anxiety, it's helpful to look at the learner as an individual. As often, children and young people like to work with others, and you've sort of got that more heads are better than one type thing, and it can take the pressure off a bit. But obviously, it's important to consider the group dynamic, as sometimes it can make a learner more uncomfortable, depending on who the group, who are in the group or who the partners are. So some learners do prefer to work alone the same way as all, not all learners like things to be too multisensory. So in relation to maths anxiety, it's just about considering the learner as an individual. Yeah. Breathing exercises can help regulate maths anxiety. You'll see sort of at the top right here, there's a five finger breathing technique. You may have seen it before. I've used it and found it to be very helpful with learners. The learner puts their finger sort of at the bottom, the learner finger from the other hand at the bottom, the base of their thumb, and breathes in for five. And sort of holds at the top, and then lets go for five. And they go round their whole hand and using this method. A child commented to me that they liked doing this because they said that their hand was always there and they could see it. She also said that she used it at other times when she found things a bit tricky. When we worked together and she, she, she would make a mistake, if she got something wrong, she used to get quite agitated and embarrassed, but she would regularly start to take her hand out and start to do that technique. So it, it did work for her. Obviously, if we want to be making it fun and it's good to incorporate play at all stages for maths anxiety, not just infants. It's been suggested that maths games are a bit like reading books for literacy and it can help with working on common misconceptions and general overlearning. And obviously games for homework can help parents survive that homework time. The book I've got pictured on the slide, it's called Help Your Child to Do Maths Even If You Don't, is a book that sort of offers ways for parents to help their children with maths. If they don't feel they're good at maths or maybe they've had a bad experience with maths, I mentioned before, it points out things not to say like, uh, oh, you're just like me, I wasn't any good at maths either. And it encourages more chat like, oh, maths is taught differently now. It'd be good if we could learn together. I would like that, sort of examples of conversations to have. Storybooks, some of you may use them already. Using storybooks can help with maths anxiety because learners often don't associate storybooks with maths. So it's a way to come at maths from a different angle. Storybooks can be used to introduce topics or help with overlearning. The Maths Through Stories website is an excellent website and it's got lessons plans and sort of books for a variety of maths topics aimed from nursery children all the way up to secondary. And it's math, basically the, the Maths Through Stories isn't just about, I used to sort of think it was more about your sort of infant children, but it's really not. They, so if you have a look at that website, you'll see what I'm talking about. And if you don't have the book, so they're suggesting they have the YouTube links with an adult reading the book, which is great, so you don't have to physically have the book. Humour, well, with anxiety, well, humour helps most things. As we know, children often like it when adults sort of highlight their own mistakes in a funny way. And it can be helpful to do this and possibly even pretend to make a mistake and sort of need their help. We want to relate uh, the maths to everyday life. Things like if they're learning time, which dyscalculate learners can find particularly difficult, as they may not often feel the passage of time. So we want to work with times that are significant to the children and young people in school, out of school. Maybe they go to after school clubs. It could be about what day do they go? When does it start? When does it finish? How long are they there? Is there a break? 
We're incorporating some food maths can help with mass anxiety. It can help them understand that weight and volume is in a real life context. As, as I mentioned before, estimating can be tricky. And if you've got real life concepts of volume and weight in relation to food, it can be helpful for children with dyscalculia to see this in a real life context. We want to create a supportive environment where it's safe to get things wrong. And in fact, it's expected. It can help children and young people feel better, understanding that they're not working if the correct level at the correct level if they're not making some mistakes. It's expected, and it's part of your job to make sure that they're being challenged enough. So you would expect a certain amount of mistakes, and they're not getting everything correct. It's helpful to have access to water, as we know, keeping hydrated can help thinking, and sometimes going to fill a water bottle can be a bit of a brain break. Maybe if they've been working on something for a long time, they might be in need of just a wee, simple wee walk. Planned in movement breaks can help some movement, move some learners and help them keep focused and help with their behaviour. Singing can also be helpful for learning maths facts. There are loads of videos on YouTube for different aspects of maths. And Education Scotland have recently released ways to incorporate maths through expressive arts. So you could have a look at that. Mastery art can be quite a mindful activity and help with mass anxiety in a similar way to storybooks. The learner may be good at art and it might appeal to them doing maths in this way. So there's a website here I've put up here and it's www.artfulmaths.com so you'd have a wee look at that and it's also another angle to come at it if there's any mass anxiety. Things like using cuisine rods, pattern blocks, jigsaws, block play and playing card games are great for helping with mass anxiety. Cuisine rods are a great resource to support learners with dyscalculia and can help all learners with their maths as effectively they might pick up things more easily or just help the learning stick that bit better. I'll say a bit more about Cuisine rods later. When considering maths anxiety, it's essential to focus on the strengths and what the learner can do. And any, interve any intervention should start at just at the point before the learning has broken down so that they're experiencing some level of success at the beginning of the intervention. Judy Hornigold talks about mass anxiety in terms of zones. You've got your red zone here. The work is sort of beyond your reach. You see it as a threat rather than a challenge. Your stress levels are increased and you're unable to learn. The growth zone, where they want the children to be, this is the new where the new learning happens. You feel safe to make mistakes. You sometimes get a bit stuck, but you can ask for help and the work might be tiring and challenging, but you feel it's achievable. And then we've got the green zone where you can do familiar tasks on your own. Your confidence is increasing and you're doing things more automatically because you've practiced them so much. So we want learners to feel that they're in that growth zone and they may sort of go in and out of the comfort zone as well. A lot of research has been done by the universe. Could you just go back one, please? Just thank you. A lot of research has been done by the University of Derby on mass anxiety in their research group, and they've got lots of videos on YouTube, including a webinar on teachers and mass anxiety. So if you're interested in that, you can have a look at that. So confidence and resilience play a huge part in learners' progress and enjoyment in maths, but many feel that maths sort of exposes them to failure and would rather not attempt a question and get it wrong. In light of this, I'm going to sort of move on to talking about making the most of mistakes. Every child has the potential for their brain to grow, no matter what their starting point is. And it can be helpful for learners to see failing as their first attempt in learning and mistakes as their first take. As we know, language matters in developing a growth mindset. People believe the stories they tell themselves are in their minds. It can be useful to look at what a child has actually answered when they get things wrong as a way of explaining it. It can be helpful to ask them how they came to, how they got an answer when they get it wrong and when they get it right, so that it's not always expected when, I, when I'm asked if how I got that answer, it's as if it's wrong. It's important to keep a growth mindset approach towards learning differences and highlight the neurons, the brain's neuroplasticity. If you want to learn more about growth mindset and mistakes, Joe Bowler has a book called Mathematical Mindsets. I've seen in school walls, eh, there's basically, they've got things like our marvellous mistakes, and they look at common misconceptions 
and they show how the mistakes have helped them and how they now learn and how they understand from their mistakes. I'm now going to move on to considering the different role and aspects of memory in maths and how we can help those learners with dyscalculia or numeracy difficulties support their memory. Key difficulties in relation to memory in maths can include remembering and retrieving numerical facts, number bonds and multiplication tables, understanding and recalling mathematical terminology, understanding word problems, performing mental calculations, especially if they're multi-step calculations, remembering and carrying out procedures as well as rules and formula, keeping track of steps in problem solving. So as you can see, we use a memory all the time in maths. So you can see why learners with memory issues have commented that they feel that they're doing a harder version of maths. They may understand, but they can't remember, which can feel frustrating and exhausting. We use the working memory regularly in maths and learners with dyscalculia can have issues with their working memory. So the working memory is the ability we have to hold in mind and mentally manipulate information for short periods of time, for example, when counting backwards. So in order to help this, we want to give questions based on what learners already know in order to develop sort of higher level mathematical skills. So if they know their five and their ten times table and you want to be working on word problems, give them questions that are sort of working on the word problem, but they're using skills that they already have and there's not too many new things going on at the one time. Give them paper for mental arithmetic and display the question being asked. Obviously, we know the importance of using concrete materials. I'm trying to avoid timing tasks and possibly take the timer off when you're using things like ICT games and things like that. I don't know if any of you watched the One Percent Club, but I was watching that the weekend and I obviously cheat and pause it because the, the feeling that it gives me is the same that, it, that learners must get who feel like they're struggling with their working memory and it makes such a difference. I know it's cheating. Anyway. I digress. So a learner may become disengaged because they have lost their place or they cannot remember the instructions. So if a, a, a child has become maybe disruptive when I walk about throwing a rubber, it might be that they've lost their place, they can't remember the instructions or they're a wee bit frustrated. So there's a booklet here called Understanding Working Memory, a classroom guide. Here's a link to it, it's on the screen. And it's just a small booklet eh, that's worth a look at for considering that. The Turner and Risedale digit memory test can be useful here as well. It's not a standardised test, but it gives you a sort of idea of, it's one of the tools you could use to sort of look at the needs of the learner. They should be able to remember two more digits forwards than they do backwards. This is a poster that I got from the Highland Numeracy blog, and I just, I liked it because it's just quite clear, because it just looks at looking at working memory, what does overload, overload look like, working memory friendly classroom, and improving learning with the working memory. So I, th I thought that was helpful, so it might be worth having a wee look at that as well. So these are some strategies to support the working memory. I did a psychology degree before I went into teaching and studied the primacy and recency effect. And it's, it's that people tend to remember more of what is said at the beginning and at the end and less of what is said in the middle. So it's important to try and take account of this in teaching and learning when relating it to memory. You want to be linking the learning to what they already know. We know maths is cumulative, so we want strong foundations and we don't want to build in sand. And connecting the learning helps with retrieval. Making it a bit different so it helps them to remember maybe a bit of outdoor learning, food maths, incorporating into trips, linking it personally. If they like football, lots of maths can be done through football cards. I could do a training session just on that. Or Pokemon cards, or if they like LOL dolls, just relating it to their interests can break down some barriers and help them to remember. We want to provide access, time to access the working memory, as it's thought teachers give possibly about two seconds to access the working memory, but it's been found that learners with working memory issues can need about eight seconds. So it's about allowing for a sort of, if I can explain it, like a comfortable struggle and then stepping in if you have to. 
Lots of overlearning, as Louise had already said, lots of opportunities and not moving on too quickly and just having that confidence not to move on. I've got a picture of long grass in a field here to use as an analogy to talk about building automaticity through building strong neural pathways with overlearning. So if you're in this field and the grass is really long and you're not sure which way to go to get home, walking through the field the first time, you have to think more and it takes more effort to walk through the grass and the grass sort of pings up behind you as you walk. The more we walk the same path, the grass gets trampled down more till it becomes flat. And it gets to a point where we don't even have to think about where we're walking. It's less tiring and it's automatic. We just follow the trodden path. It's the same with overlearning. The more we practice, the more automatic the learning becomes and we develop stronger neural pathways. In order to support the memory, we want to encourage learners to look for patterns, sequences, connections, as learners with dyscalculia may not automatically make the associations. You may have to explicitly point them out to them. They may not have noticed a pattern or a connection that you might have expected them to. And learning how to fill a multiplication square can also, believe it or not, help reduce maths anxiety and help memory if they're shown how to work facts out from the ones they already know. I thought this was a good thing to share from the Dyscalculia Network as it shows the pre-skills checklist for times, tables and divisions. So these are the sort of prerequisite skills learners require before they move on to learning about multiplication and division. It's worth having a look at. It's a bit like what Louise took you through with perimeter to think about those things. These are the suggested things that you would want learners to be able to do before you move on to multiplication. Okay, so in terms of helping learners remember their multiplication facts, once they properly understand the concept, it can be a relief for them to know that they only need to know the one, the two, the five and the ten times table, and they can work out the rest just using these. The same way as we can use the amounts of money that we need from the coins, like the one pence, two pence, five pence and ten pence. We've got those coins so we can make up anything we need. And it can be a relief for children and young people because they're usually the tables that they're most comfortable with. So you can use your knowledge of other facts to help us remember the ones we don't. And it's good because if we're asked the capital of France and we don't know, we can't remember it. And are you remembering what the other capital cities are going to help? But if we do know seven times, we don't know what seven times eight is, we can use our knowledge of other tables to help us work it out. I'll give you a short example of how to reduce the memory load. So say there's 121 facts, how can we reduce this? Well, if you know the zero, the one and the 10, you take them away, then you're left with those. And then you know the two and the five, and you're left with those. And then you've got the commutative law and that sort of line of symmetry down the middle and you take those away. And you're left with really only these ones here. And these ones can be worked out through doubling, halving, step counting, or maybe some mnemonics. So it's, it's really quite, can be quite a relief to children to be able to do this. The three times table, you can do step counting. With the four times table, you could do your doubles. With the six, the seven and eight and the nine, you can do basically using your other tables to help you. So if you don't know like six times six, you could do one times six, add five times six. Or if you don't know seven times eight, you could do two times eight and five times eight and add them together. Because children are obviously often quite happy to add, multi use the ones they know and add them. Or well, let's say they don't know 81, if they know we'll add those two digits. So it's about making them comfortable with doubling, halving, step counting, things like that. And that hopefully should be able to help them relieve that sort of feeling of not there's too much for them to remember. Pupils and adults that have found, have found this thing in the left particularly useful and it's easy to make. It's basically like a L-shaped ruler back to front and it helps with us if there's any visual stress or if learners have difficult tracking down the side and it's quite a hard thing to do that, to meet, make your fingers meet. The number square can look a bit busy as well so it helps with that and there's a plastic one in the right which is called a flexi table that you can buy commercially and just fold it into the, the table that you want to know. So further strategies to support memory 
We know that working for short periods, chunking information, learners with dyscalculia can get tired more easily and feel, as we said, that they're doing a harder version of maths. So a little often is a good approach. Making a set of memory cards eh, with the facts can help if they forget and with the ones that they regularly forget or in new information that they're learning on them. You can have the question on one side and the answer on the other, just using them as flashcards. Giving learners a maths mat with the days of the week, months of the year, tables on it, things like that. Learners could also have all this on their iPad or phone if they prefer to have it a wee bit more discreet. We'll be using post-its, highlighters. And it's important to teach children how to use a calculator because some children are given a calculator, but it can overcomplicate things because they get mixed up with signs anyway and because they're not sure of the functionality. It can just put another layer of difficulty. So it's about making sure that they have lots of practice using it. And the Discalculator app can help with this as it reads out the numbers and the signs and you can read it in words too. So they can sort of cross check it and you can record your own voice. So it can hear, the child can hear their own voice saying add or subtract or whatever it is that the computer, the, the calculator is reading back. Multi-sensory approaches, as we know, can help with memory. Visual strategies like mind maps, bar modelling. The Mass Visuals website is very good for showing place value and time. Auditory strategies like they can make up mnemonics. Well, there are lots of mnemonics out there, but if they make them up themselves, it can help. Verbal rehearsal on the iPad is also good, as it's been pointed out that we often remember things better by hearing our own voice. So, for example, you might hear if a learner puts on their stations of the tables and then listens to their own voice back as a way of learning it, because apparently you're better at listening to your own voice to help you learn things. So transferring from the left to the right hand side of the brain, maybe making a song or doing it in PE, Maybe the learner's strength is in their creativity and their ability to think visually. So it helps them to remember by giving opportunities to access this, these parts of their brain. We want to make it meaningful using real menus. So say if they like Domino's pizza, something like that. Or if they get the bus regularly, look at the tables. Or if they go to the gym, looking at the gym timetables. Maybe they like gaming. You look at gaming catalogues online to look at prices and things like that. It's about making it meaningful to them and appealing. That's just here, just a couple of examples of mnemonic memory cards. You'll have seen this uh, eight times eight is 64, right? eight and eight times six and the four. Children love things that are disgusting. But then we've got five, six, seven, eight, 56 is seven times eight. You've got your number, your other ones down at the bottom. They're just an example of your memory cards. I've got a times tables tricks book, but basically it's how you use your hands to sort of help you with the times tables, a bit like what's happening at the bottom. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything should all be about tips and tricks. It's obviously there has to be a con conceptual understanding first, and these can just help act as hooks to get them there as long as they understand what's happening. Rossi Stone in the top right-hand corner, uh, he makes deco comics, and he's dyslexic himself, and he does revision aids through comics and drawing. He does workshops and videos on remembering information in both literacy and some aspects of numeracy through drawing comics and creative drawings and games. So if you've got a learner who learns visually and is creative in their thinking, this type of thing can be useful for them. I'm going to move on to processing speed. Students with dyscalculia can have issues with processing speed. It's important to give students more time to do to do it or maybe say I'll come back to you later. An additional 25% more time can be a help or ask for fewer examples expected of them, just enough to show that they understand and they've retained the new learning. Verbalise, visualise and draw problems. As Louise mentioned earlier, Professor Sharma feels that the concrete pictorial abstract approach should, be include, should include visualise and script. If learners have developed scripts for mathematical concepts in their minds, it supports the working memory, processing speed and automaticity. You often know an example of this, that you've embedded a script in a learner is when you sort of hear your own voice back when the learner is explaining either to you or to another learner how they got an answer. The dyscalculia network has also highlighted the need to verbalise everything as they're doing it as well, and they feel that that should be included 
as it supports processing. Um, it's about not intervening too quickly as well, um, because it, it, it can help processing as learners feel that they've got enough time to work things out or to answer the question. You know what it's like when you're sort of almost there and someone says you, somebody says something, usually trying to help you, but it puts you off your chain of thought. This is especially hard if you have issues with processing speed. It also can be helpful to try and avoid reframing questions. An example of this would be when you sort of say to a child, well, what's eight plus two? And then you say, trying to help, if I had eight sweets and then I got another two, how many would that be all together? Or if I had eight Mars bars and two Twixes, how many is that all together? And sometimes this kind of thing does help children by making it real and things like that. But if they have dyscalculia, it can be confusing as they're thinking about each, end of question, each individual question and they're not able to generalise or make a connection. So it can make them feel that they're sort of asking, answering three different questions. I've done this in the past. And I'm sort of trying not to do it now and control it depending on the learner. I'm going to move on to talking about the ways in which dyscalculia can affect different aspects of language of maths and strategies to support. Mathematical language can be confusing for so many reasons. It's succinct and children need to be able to understand the shorthand we have for maths. You can do your words, I think everybody's done it, but you do your words that mean addition and subtraction and etc. But it's important to remember that similar phrases can have a different meaning. For example, in the bubbles here, it's how many more than 23 is 27? And you may be thinking about finding the difference. But what is 23 more than 27 is addition? So the word more is an example of how a word can mean different things. It doesn't it won't always be adding or subtraction. This has to be considered, especially when doing maths word problems. When we read, we read left to right. But maths, with maths, sometimes we go left to right and sometimes we go right to left. And this can confuse some learners. So it's important to remember that. And words in maths can have multiple meanings. For example, if you've got the word degree here in a bubble, it can mean the amount of something. It can be do with temperature. It can be to do with angles. It can be do with a qualification or table. You get a table that you sit at. You might have a multiplication table, a timetable, a table of results. And you've got odd, what, so you're saying there's strange numbers as well. So it can be worth looking at the different meanings of words that we use in maths as what the meanings that learners already know and have for the different words can affect like what they, what they already know, meanings that the children know that there's some are related to the maths, the words that they know, and some have nothing to do with the maths. Counting words have been used for centuries and some have stayed quite similar in different languages. And it's a bit of a shame for children learning English, counting and place value, because they sort of master the number words one to 10, they're feeling all good, and then they're hit with the number of words from 11 to 19. And it can be confusing due to how we say them and how they sound. When we say 14, we're saying the four first, and in some languages, 14, it's more transparent. It's just 10, it, it translates 10, four, or 11, that's just, Bit even harder, but it just translates in other languages to 10 1. So after 19, the numbers can make more sense to children with dyscalculia. Um, because I work with Glasgow Dyslexia Support Service, I'm particularly interested in the parallels between how children learn to read and how children develop number concepts. Professor Sharma has highlighted some parallels, parallels and I have unpicked it a bit further. So in terms of reading, you've got your 26 letters in the alphabet and with your numeracy, you've got your 10 digits, your mathematical alphabet. You can think about it like that. Uh, with reading, you're mapping your letters to sounds. And with numeracy, you're mapping digits to a numerical quantity and amount. With your reading, you've got your words and these words have meanings. And with the numerals, you have to know what that number means in terms of place value. You might have your 100 sight words, or it can go on further. But with numeracy, Professor Shar Sharma has said that you've got your 45 sight facts that you, that you need to learn. With reading, you've got your phonemic awareness, and you're thinking about blending and segmenting sounds. 
Whereas with number, you've got your decomposition and recomposition of number where you're breaking numbers down, but you can also build them up to make other numbers. And within all this, with the literacy, you want them to develop their word attack skills. And with numeracy, you want to develop those number attack skills. And all this is all developed more with lots of over learning. I just thought it would be useful to share the sort of the comparisons. I mentioned the 45 site facts. These are the 45 site facts that Professor Sharma thinks that children need to have, like the way that you need your your hundred common words um, and they, that can be taught using the visual cluster cards there's a visual that's a link there to the visual cluster cards uh, that you could print them off you can buy some of them commercially um, and within language we use lots of multisyllabic words We've got words like multiplication, quadrilateral, isosceles. So it's helpful to use the, the mathematical words for our syllable counting activities as well and incorporate them into games. Dyscalculia has been linked to poor phonological awareness by uh, Daniel and Zari, and it can be hard for dyslexic le dys dyscalculic learners to think about what they have heard and what they need to write. Pupils with dyscalculia can find word problems difficult. A strategy to support word problems could be getting the children to translate from the maths to the problem. For example, you could show the calculation you want them to do with the concrete materials and then get the children themselves to write the word problem instead of always answering the problems. So they're working from the maths problem to the, the sorry, so they're working from the maths to the problem rather than the word problem to the maths. And it can help them gain a sort of different perspective on word problems. Another approach to word problems could be to take the numbers out completely and just look at the question and what the language is asking you to do. Here's some examples of numberless word problems. So there's also numberless word problems available. I put a link at the bottom, but there are others. So here are a couple of examples of the kind of things that you might see in numberless word problems. So Cameron has five toy cars. Harry has three more toy cars than Cameron. How many toy cars uh, do the two friends have all together? Now, if they're just sort of number plucking and add them, they might just go, oh, we'll add five and three. But obviously Harry's got more than Cameron. So when you do the numberless problem, you can kind of talk about that aspect. So Cameron has some toy cars. Harry has some more toy cars than Cameron. How many toy cars do the two friends have all together? So learners can make sense of the quantities, the relationships and the questions before the numbers are introduced and then the numbers are sort of slowly introduced. So that's another way of sort of looking at word problems. This is a wee game called Listen Up. Uh, a co common issue that this dyscalculate learners and learners with math difficulties have is getting confused with the teen and the t sound in numbers. This is an example of a game where learners have to listen to whether they hear a teen sound at the end or t in, uh, in the number word. Uh, they don't see the number being read out. The number cards on the left are then cut up and you can put the word teen or t on the back and then the, another person reads the number and they have to tell them which column to put it in. Now they can self-correct at the end by looking at the back of the card to check if they've got it right. And if you want them to practice actually saying the words, then the roles could be reversed. You can do lots of different things with these cards in terms of bingo or pairs, just lots of ways to reinforce this common error uh, to reinforce the teaching point. As I said, learners can get mixed up with the T and T sound and sometimes they transpose the numbers by putting them around the wrong way. And it can help make things clearer by getting learners to make up the numbers that they're confusing. If they keep making mistakes with 31 and 13, getting them to make it up and put them into groups of 10. Some of you may have already used the Freer model to develop vocabulary and literacy, but it's good for maths too. And children often like the non-example aspect of this. So you've got your definition, your facts, your non-examples and then your examples. So that's quite a nice activity to do. 
then if you're investigating magmatical words through morphology, it can be helpful for understanding. Like an example of this could be looking at the different by words, try, senti, and quad, and what they mean. It's important to explicitly teach vocabulary. We want to use the correct terminology. I think it was Louise that previously said that if, if the children can say the dinosaur names, then they can use the appropriate mathematical terminology. Using the correct terminology, it, it's worth pointing out that not all calculations are sums. It can be confusing to call a different of different. It can be confusing to call a group of different calculations sums, as the word sum in mass is a result of adding numbers. It's helpful to do not use the word sums for all calculations. To use to use the word calculation. Word aware approaches can be used as the same way uh, as the Freire model. It can be used in terms of using it to develop literacy in vocabulary or developing mathematical vocabulary. Now, Christopher Daniels uses this technique to get children and learners to talk about maths. Um, and it's good for learners with dyscalculia or numeracy difficulties because there are lots of ways of choosing a, a unique one. It can be like a low floor, high ceiling task. And the website has got lots of different themes, like the ones at the bottom. So it might say which one doesn't belong. You've got the shape one, you've got ones about number, and then you've got ones about graphs. And I put this one up at the top, and I thought we could have a go at this one. So if you could comment in the chat to see which one you think doesn't belong. Now, you can pick any one as long as you sort of see why you think it's unique. So if you could have a go at doing that just now, which one you think doesn't belong and write why. The cactus as isn't a square. Fair enough. Yep. Any other reasons for any of them? It can be as wacky as you like. A cactus isn't square. Green, it doesn't have four sides. Yep. It's a different shape. Yep. Mm hmm The green one. The cactus, so we're mostly feeling the cactus. The star one as it's an even number. Good. Pink one as it's the only smooth one. Yellow even. The star because it's bright. Fair enough. That's what the children will say, things like that. And it's okay it's just to get them to, to join in. Purple is larger. The purple because it has long lines. Yellow, others odd numbers. Okay, great. So people will say like, oh, it's the green one because it's the only one that's full. Uh, you can say, well, the green because it's not symmetrical. Yellow because it's a primary colour. Or orange because it's not sort of orientated on its base. So this was actually put on uh, Simon Gregg, who's an advocate of Cuisinier Rods that I follow. And he put this on and this was the kind of things that people were saying. So just to give you a wee example, yellow's a primary colour. Yeah, I see that. Or somebody had written uh, the purple one just because it's the most boring. <laughs> Star one is it's an even number. OK, great. So here we have, if we go on to the next slide, thanks. That was just a wee example to let you see how you can use which one doesn't belong for language. So to help with reading and maths, you could be using a coloured overlay if there's any visual stress or anything. You can also use your iPad for text to speech and speech to text. There's aperture cards that you can use. Uh, I'll show you that in the next slide in a minute. You want to highlight and colour your symbols, make them large. Maybe keep uh, your addition sign a colour, your subtraction sign a colour. You want to watch out for perseverating. That's where a child does one addition and thinks the whole rest of the questions are going to be addition, so they just keep going with addition. A visual dictionary is helpful, like you can get commercial ones up in the top right hand corner, or a personal dictionary where they write their own things. Topic word banks, developing those before the activity, and also maybe watching some tutorials, like um, there's a maths explained by Steve Chin, so maybe showing a tutorial first before they could take home and watch that. 
you want to consider the non-mathematical problems and highlight the keywords, make sure the reading age is appropriate. You could be using the ruler just to keep your space or to do simple addition and subtraction. So I want less graphics in the page, not too busy. You could be using office lens so that it can, you take a picture of it and then it's got the facility to be able to use the text to speech. And then equatio is something I discovered recently and it's particularly good for translating a mathematical notation because sometimes the text to speech isn't as good at that. Thank you. So here's the aperture cards. It's basically just two sort of C shaped one back to front and you can sort of hone in in the question that you want them to look at and they can do it if the page is too busy then they can sort of keep pull it out or focus it in. You can use it for reading with words as well. Or you might want coloured math jotters if the glare is just too much. This is just an example of a math journaling jotter and it's about 3D shapes. So they could have things that they're forgetting or things they want to remember or any information that they're sort of working on, but they've got their own wee journal that they're journaling the things that they want to remember. But this could also be done in sort of a book creator app on the iPad as well. Bar modelling is an excellent way to support children with dyslexia and dyscalculia to do word problems as they still need to be able to do the maths, but it helps them to do the correct maths. And it provides that bridge between the word problem and the maths. As they can often do the maths, they just need to know which maths to do. So we want to start off simple and build to the more complex problems. Even if the teachers ourselves, it's good when we're learning them just to look at the simple ones and then build. And there's a couple of links here that you can use. Increasing our rods <clears throat> and a really good way to help children move from seeing the numbers as a string of ones because they're a continuous uh, they're a continuous material it sort of gets children out of that count that counting trap where they keep wanting to go to count right back to the, the start again they can't do that when they're using the cuisineer rods and children learn maths visually which supports the memory supports developing those scripts and that visualization they have got, they've got various uses, as you can see, all round about. And then for all stages, uh, children can take ownership of their own learning and sort of self-correct through play and investigation. Now, in the next session, I'm going to be taking a sort of closer look at using Cuisinaire rods. So if you want to sort of bring some along and we can have, you can maybe have a wee play with them as I'm chatting to you, that they're excellent for developing number sense which is how we want to be helping our dyscalculate learners. So just before we finish up, I thought, well, before I finish up, I just wanted to sort of ask you what were your favourite maths websites that you use in terms of games, tutorials, maybe lessons. And if you sort of put on, if you think it's, if it's primary or secondary, so you could be putting these on and then what we'll do is we'll collate them at the end and we'll put them onto the Padlet. I just thought it was a good opportunity to sort of share what we're using. And um, so I'll just put my... If you want to just put them in and then Iona will collate them. So we've got top marks, yep. That's got... Okay, so I'll let you just keep feeding that in and I'll pass you back over to Louise, is it? Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of slides left. Do really just run about that ICT? It's just something what we're we're going what we're kind of talking about at the moment, and it's really just um, for a few minutes to highlight some key apps and um, ICT websites, etc., um, which I've found um, helpful. We will go into the next part about kind of key resources in the next session. We're not going to have time today, but we have got everything ready. But we'll do that in the next session. Um, have we got this slide? Yep, yeah, here we go. So I think a few people have actually mentioned this already. So if um, perhaps you're maybe setting homework, but you're not able to actually give home the concrete, but I've got my wee cleaving air box, and you're not able to give that physically home, then you can actually direct the young people towards MathSpot. Or if you're doing it as a lesson in the classroom as well, and you're wanting to move to that more pictorial, um, then MathSpot's a great resource and this link will take you straight to it where you've got all of those different um, manipulatives there ready to hand. 
Um, this other one, the Toy Theatre as well, is also, it's got a lot of really good, when we're thinking more about that kind of fractions, the percentages, giving you spinners and clocks, etc. Um, and also the dice. And I know that Active Inspire has the dice um, on it within the maths tool part as well for your Promethean board. Um, this is a map which um, I came across. Some did pop in the White Rose, but this is the White Rose uh, One Minute Math app. Um, again, for those young people who don't get phased by being timed, and it's a really, really good one for just giving that uh, young people um, that kind of quick thing. I have it on my phone. I've popped it on the iPad, which I use with the young people, and they, we can go in. And once they're co completely secure on a particular concept, then we can go into this, and it literally gives them one minute to complete as many as they can. So you've got subitizing, and then you've got the full operations as well but it breaks everything right down and um, the next one is splat sorry <laughs> sorry Iona uh, the next one is um sorry get yeah, so as I say this one's a really really good one the next one is splat uh, this is a fabulous um website which has got a wide range of um powerpoints which you can then download and use with your, your youngsters is a great warm-up activity and it's really developing that uh, subitizing skill so it starts off by showing um a particular pattern and then it'll move on and it's asking, so how many blue shapes do you see? And then you've got your answer and then it'll put in a big splat and then it's going to carry on and then it's going, how many shapes are underneath it? How, how do you know? So it's really thinking about that part, part, whole model as well, but it's really, really good fun. So again, putting in that question again, how else can you know? So you're trying to prompt them to come up with another one. Okay, let's look and let's see if we're right. So there's about over a hundred different variations of these so it's really really good fun and um, particularly if, even for your older children if you're using it um as i said because a lot of our youngsters maybe can only subitize up to about six or seven but it's a really good one even just from for discussion points of view and um, so that's great and the link for that's down the bottom and um, this is the ipad app from the call center so um you can go on to click on the link and this is going to give you a wide range of um android and ipad apps that you can then use and this is a um i find it really helpful for, for particular children if they've got um particular difficulties and there's actually one on it um, which i'll talk about in just a second photo maths that i found quite helpful and this website I find is fantastic and um, particularly when I was a um, a mum of a, a third year getting into fourth year during lockdown and I hadn't obviously studied up to that level of maths and numeracy for a long long time but um, you've got a free subscription to it which is the rigor maths and you get the um, the rigor a day but I find this calendar really really good and I've used it with all of my learners at the moment and I give them a couple of questions um, in their jotter to complete at the start as a warm-up for every session so it's a really really good um, way that you can then consolidate learning that's already going on I don't use all of it um, I, I can basically cut, cut them out, I sit them in the jaw and I keep the ones so that the young person I'm working with is struggling with time and money. I don't put anything to do with time and money and I just put in the bits that I know that are there. But it also lets me get a real kind of handle on that for that overlearning. So even though we're working on something else, we can use that. But as a class situation, you can, it comes up on rigor. It comes up as a one like every day that comes up with a question. Um, and they also have a newspaper as well that they put up and it's the word problems um, and they're all relating into what's going on and the other thing linking in with what Laura was saying earlier on is if you subscribe to it and um, there are videos um, that are really really good kind of teaching opportunity that you can then use and send home so if you've taught a particular um, lesson on say rounding then you can then send that link home to say this is a, an example of this and it means again you're sharing it with the, the parents as well which I just say I used to have to sit and do it the night before and find out what he was my son was learning and then go and can I help him the next day? But I found it to be really, really self-explanatory, well um, structured, broken down into that kind of progressive steps as well. So they're really, um, really good. And then, as I said, this photo app um, was really good, um, particularly, I think, maybe more so, so for that secondary stage again. Um, and what you do is, is that it automatically solves the problem, making sure, obviously, the handwriting and things are there. So you basically just, it's, you've got the, the app, you open it up, you take a picture, of the actual um, operation and calculation, and then it gives you a step by step how to solve that. So, as again, like particularly for more complex like algebra, etc. Um, but it's also good as well just for our youngsters for self checking as well. So, but I found that to be a really, really helpful app. And I'll hand you back now over to Iona. 
Thanks, Louise, and thanks, Laura, as well. Uh, we are hugely aware that we've been speaking now for an hour and 20 minutes, and we have bombarded you with so many ideas and strategies and hints and tips. And we're probably doing exactly against what we would do with learners about mental overload and various things. So we we are, we, we apologise in that, but we are aware of what we're trying to do is to make sure we're covering a lot of different things. I'm sure there's a lot of things in today's webinar that won't be new to you and it may be reinforcing things that you do already, but also that hopefully there's a few new things that you might be able to take away. Um, please don't try and take away absolutely everything. Uh, that's absolutely not what we would want you to do. Um, really trying to think a few of uh, one or two things that you might want to try. And the recording is there and the slides are there for you to go back and have a look at over a period of time and not try and take everything away. So maybe just uh, this might be just helpful for us, just if you want to pop in the chat. Um, what, uh, you've already shared your top tips for, for um, apps and things. Um, just if there's anything that you already use uh, that you find useful and you've not shared that already, please do just pop in your recommendations in particular. It might be something that we've mentioned or something that we've not. And thank you to all of you who've done that already. Um, but maybe if you could just consider what, what's maybe the one or two things that you are going to be taking away from this one, uh, this webinar in particular, um, that maybe changed your thinking a little bit and, and maybe made you reprioritise and think, yep, actually, I've got some learners in mind. This is what I need to do with them. So maybe give you just a minute or two uh, just to, to think about that and pop any ideas in the chat um, about what you're, you know, in, in many ways your thinking has changed. I do have a link to an evaluation as well that I'm just, uh, just going to quickly, it's, there's a QR code I'm going to quickly wait to that so that I can come back again. So again, please, what has thinking, in what way has your thinking changed? I'm going to pop a link to the evaluation in the chat and I will go on to the QR code in a second so that if you've got a second device and I ain't eating until I sick on the floor. Yeah, I think a lot <laughs> of the learners are going to be, you know, that's one that would be popular, popular with certain early years. So just a Somebody few things. Somebody mentioned you know. um, in the chat there about the SQA for Nat5 Maths. Um, I mean, as far as we're aware, even from an ESM perspective, as long as um, you don't have to have a formal identification of um, dyscalculia in order to have that, as long as there can be evidence to show that the young person um, benefits from these particular tools and they've got the conceptual understanding, etc. That's what kind of right being, isn't it, as well, Iona, that they, as long as you can show the evidence base that pre before using whatever strategies, calculators or whatever. But again, um, it all has to be means tested against um, and then obviously the evidence base as well to be able to show. Yeah, and it's, it's certainly something you would hope has been building up across a number of years. And it isn't Absolutely. something that the, the, um, the additional assessment arrangements are not parachuted in at exam time that actually it's what it's what the, the, the learners have been used to over over the years as you've gone through whenever you've done formal assessment we want to make sure that they're you know if they if they do have a particular difficulty whether it's a formal identification or not that we're, we're trying to focus on what we're trying to assess and that's the thing about our national five maths for example is that you you know you don't get marks for knowing your times tables in national five and so if a learner has a specific difficulty with that we want them to not be a barrier to them being able to do national five maths if they can do it so uh so lots of things there i'm um, just trying to uh, i will try and capture the chat as best i can it, th there's no easy easy way to do it but i'm gonna i'll, I'll sit and work with that um just thinking what else is there Visual overload. There's lots of interesting things. We will sit and have a look at that. And uh, it's great that there's everybody seems to have taken away something slightly different, which is which is great. And that's kind of what we hope would be the case. Um, if you've got your uh, a second device at the ready with a QR code reader, um, we would appreciate this is the Education Scotland National Events um, evaluation. Really good to hear 
what you think of it. And uh, we do have a fourth session coming up on the 6th of June. If you can get onto Eventbrite and sign up for that to make sure that you've got, um, that you, you get the link sent to you in plenty of time so that you know what's going on, just uh, um, please do uh, sign up for that. But if you can't make the 6th of June, um, it will be recorded again and uh, everything, as I say, will go in the Padlet. If you have any, I think we're OK for session four. I think we've got that tidied up, but we are starting to think about what kind of supports we would like to put in place for next session. And so if you've got any um, any ideas around that or anything that you feel we've not covered in these sessions and would be useful, please do get in touch. Um, I'm just going to pop our um, email address. It's mathematics at education Scotland. Uh, dot .scot. um, uh, please get in touch and let us know what sort of further sessions might be useful during next year, uh, because uh, that's what we're, we're starting to be at the planning stage for that now um, as well. And if you're interested in getting involved with the support next next session, uh, we're always really grateful to hear stories from other local authorities as well. So please do get in touch um, if there's if there's anything that you would like to be involved in. I think we're happy to hang around for a minute or two if there's any other questions. Um, but it's 5.29 for a moment there. I didn't think there was any hope of us finishing on time, but we have <laughs> managed it. Phew, you'll probably all be exhausted. Uh, you're very welcome to just drop us a line with questions uh, or, or get in touch with us. But a huge thank you to Louise and Laura for their hard work, not just in delivering this, but putting, out the, the, putting the presentation together. Thank you all so much for your contributions and for coming along. Um, we hope to see you as many as possible in, in June. Um, uh, take care of yourselves and uh, have a good month and we'll, we'll hopefully see you in June. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.